Thanks for checking out this video. So I did a thing and I thought that maybe if I put it on a uh, video that other people would find this helpful, at least for someone like me in the past, as in prior to doing this thing. So for the longest time, I have loved, loved, loved Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, but been fully aware that there are a lot of, lot of differences between that film and Stephen King's original book. Now, I've said so many times over the years that I, I should read the book, I should read the book, I should read the book and find out the difference and see if the book's better and, you know, all that jazz. So one of my friends pushed me, Rich Smith, thank you very much, Rich, and he just bought me the book and gave it to me and said, look, you've talked about it, I figure, just read it. So that was the impetus for me to go ahead and read through The Entire Shining, which for me personally is a pretty big feat because it's a long book, it's over 600 pages, and I'm a slow reader, and I don't really read many books, period. I'm more of a movie person, as you can tell by all the review videos I put on my channel. So I thought I'd make a video just kind of break down for anyone who doesn't want to read through the whole book but wants to know what the differences are. Here's what's missing from The Shining, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And I will say that um, a lot of people will say, you know, oh, I like the book, it's so much better. I like the movie, it's so much better. And they choose one. I'm kind of in this camp after reading the book of I like both of them and I like them together. Uh, I feel like it, it was the proper uh, order for me personally to have seen the movie first and then read the book because I feel like you not only see the differences, but it gives you extra context for the movie so that you can go back, rewatch the movie, and understand more of what was behind those characters when they were put on the film. And it really does help with that particular story, even though it is different. So, just saying. So, one of the big things is there's more time to kind of slowly develop uh, the entire scenario and the gradual deterioration of Jack within the book, obviously, because, you know, what, about two hours of film versus about over 600 pages of book, you just have a lot more space and a lot more time to develop things. And, it's the pacing of it is wonderful. I mean, it, this is considered to be one of Stephen King's best books, and I easily see why, because everything feels real. It feels like it's done at a great pace, and it feels like you see it happening, and none none of the stuff takes any ridiculous leap, in my opinion. Like it, It's just these little moments that kind of add on top of each other that feel like they fit within the story that end up leading to that bigger, terrible thing that happens. And the biggest thing being the deterioration of Jack. You know, you get inside of Jack's head. Uh, you get inside of Danny's head. You get inside of the mother... Why am I blanking on her name right now? Um, the mother's head. Why am I blanking on this? It it'll come up later. But Wendy, sorry. Okay, I looked back at my notes. One of those moments. I'm getting old, you know? Yeah, you get inside of Wendy's head. And that's another thing, is you get so much more from Wendy's perspective. I feel like the film really does minimalize Wendy as a character in general, and just makes her someone who panics and is just there to be a victim. Uh, she's a much stronger character in the book, and you get a lot from her perspective. She's actually the person who puts everything together, story-wise, of what's really going on with the Overlook and Danny versus the Overlook. So that's a huge thing. She is more of a hero than a victim in the book, and I think that's another huge difference. But the big, 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 big thing, like I said, is Jack's deterioration and how real it feels and how messed up it is. But it's also just the insight into Jack's past, the insight into Jack not being a terrible person, because in the film, it seems like he's just a bad guy from the get-go and he just gets worse. In the book, since you get so much inner dialogue from him or inner monologue from him, uh, you understand him more. You feel for him somewhat. You see, you get information about how he was brought up as a child and how that played into how he turned out. His fight with alcohol addiction, which I know is a big theme within the book intentionally by Stephen King because he went through that. And it you just get a lot more and he actually becomes kind of a sympathetic character to a degree. And in the book, there is this separation of what is him and what is the overlook, not he's a terrible person and then he just gets worse. So it, there's way more impact to be had from the book for that reason. Um, I already talked about that. Danny experiencing the thoughts and feelings of his parents 
as the Overlook becomes more sinister and their relationship takes a similar turn. Uh, like I said, you know, you get a lot more kind of inner monologue and feelings and everything from the characters. And the the one of the big benefits from Danny's standpoint is you understand that he feels what's going on with his parents, which you don't get that from the movie. So when their relationship starts to fall apart, partially because of, well, large part because of what the Overlook is doing to Jack, and the Overlook's trying to use Jack as a way to get to Danny because Danny is like this very strong power, which you get that in the movie, obviously. But um, his ability to kind of feel that, uh, it, it adds more impact to the story. And it, it adds more of a kind of like building dread for him in the, in the story as opposed to what's there in the film. Uh, because you're reading it and you're seeing that, you know, he's getting more and more suspicious of what's going on. He's getting more and more afraid of what's going on. And as a kid, it's terrible because of the how young he is and how much he has to deal with because he's got this special power. So, yeah. Uh, you get more information about the Overlook's history. That's one of the big things that's not touched on at all in the movie. But in the book, they go into some pretty good depth about the Overlook's history, which makes the Overlook even more of a character in the book. And I love that. It brings it to life a lot more. I love it. The hedge animals, that's one thing. Totally left out of the movie. There are these hedge animals, which are, you know, like bushes that are shaped into animals that are not at all in the movie. In the book, they have they show up quite a few times. They have a pretty significant role of coming after people. They actually kind of come to life and come after people. They actually inflict some actual physical damage on people, have actual injuries for a few characters. So that is very different. Even though I don't think it... It doesn't really impact the story overall that much. It's just an extra thing that the Overlook does that's interesting. Wendy actually experiences experiences happenings with the hotel when the elevator starts working at night and there's kind of confetti and streamers and masks and everything. So not only is Wendy more of a character and she's more of a hero than a victim, she also actually experiences some stuff from the Overlook. So in the movie, she experiences nothing, basically. She's just experiencing the changes in Jack's behavior and then things that are done to Danny that she has to deal with. In the book, she experiences things, as does Jack, as does Danny, but it's kind of this progression of it. So, like, she experiences the least, then it's Jack, then it's Danny, because of kind of their levels of how in tune they are with the Overlook. So, that is an important thing. There are a bunch of parallels drawn to the story The Mask of the Red Death that comes up quite a few times in the actual writing, never comes up in the movie, and it is appropriate, kind of those parallels between the stories of what it is. So that's awesome. Uh, I really did enjoy that um, in the writing. There are questions raised of how much parents influence who their children become, which is pondered by both Wendy and Jack because of Jack's father and also Wendy's mother. So I talked about how you get insight into Jack's upbringing and what made him who he is, but you also get that for Wendy a little bit and her fears of becoming her mother because she has a very troubled relationship with her mother. Her, It sounds like, at least the way it's written out, her mother wasn't a very good person. Same thing with Jack's dad. So it's this kind of mirroring of both of them being afraid of becoming their mother or becoming their father. And then to some degree, actually, that happens more so with, with Jack. But it plays to something that's very real in life, which is people's fears of becoming all the shortcomings of their parents. I know a lot of people struggle with that. So yeah. And you don't get that you don't you don't get that nearly as much in the film. Wendy is aware of the overlook's condition and Danny's as well. She verbalizes most of the revelations about it. I talked about that earlier. So she's a very important part of piecing things together in the book. She's not at all in the movie. Jack becomes so close to and influenced by the Overlook that he wants to join the staff and work his way up to manager. He, the hooks of the Overlook get in him so much at some point that he talks about actually joining it. So for me, this was really good on giving me more clarity into what it means at the end of the movie where he's in that picture with all the other people at the Overlook, that old black and white picture. Because in the book, he wants to become 
the staff. Like, he starts to act like he works for the Overlook, and then he starts legitimately having these delusions about working his way up to manager there, believing that he's in this time with all these other people there who aren't there anymore. They're all ghosts, basically. Um, so that was great for giving more context to the movie because the ending's a little cryptic in, in Kubrick's film because of that. So this is why, partially why I say that reading the book after seeing the movie gives it so much more context, and I, and I like that. Um, I already talked about the hedge animals. I don't know why I put that twice on my notes. <laughs> Danny meeting Tony in an alternate overlook in his mind. That happens. Uh, Tony's kind of abandoned for the most part after the very beginning in the film. Uh, Tony comes up, eh, he gets lost for a bit in the book, but then he comes up at, kind of at a key point and in this kind of alternate universe, basically, or like alternate state of existence, Danny meets Tony in, in a different overlook and kind of gets pertinent information to, to trying to save himself and his family. And um, obviously that doesn't happen in the movie at all. And I think it was a good thing to, to have in there. And I kind of wish they would have done it in the movie, but you know, you get insight into the overlook wanting to have Danny for his power in the film. It just seems like events without motive, basically, you know, you, you don't get that context of the overlook is really coming for him Danny specifically to harness his power. I know that gets integrated into Dr. Sleep, though, because Mike Flanagan did a good job of kind of bringing all the sources together to kind of make the the best story possible to bridge the gap between Kubrick's film and, and King's book. Uh, Dick Halloran survives and is momentarily overtaken by the, hotel, by the Overlook. That's another thing. Very interesting. For a little bit, Halloran becomes a minion of the Overlook. It's very, very brief in the book, but it's um, it gives you more insight into how invasive the Overlook is. It can't just get into one person. Um, and it, it, it's kind of a scary moment in the book, actually, because you're like, oh no, I think we're going to lose Halloran at this point. The other thing is, Halloran gets killed pretty much immediately in the movie, and that's one thing I really hate about the movie, is he's an interesting, cool character, and once he gets to the Overlook to help Danny out and Wendy, he just gets axed and that's the end of it. It's, it's so anticlimactic. It feels like everything with Halloran in the movie was for nothing, where he feels like he's much more important in the book and he really matters. And he's a great character in the book and I love that he survives. And they have, you know, a whole thing in the end where it's, you know, flashing forward a bunch of years and Halloran is, you know, still there. Uh, in touch with the family, and it, it's a good ending. And then the Overlook explodes. That's another thing. The Overlook explodes at the end of the book, giving this kind of finality to done. We're good here. So that's actually all I had. Hopefully people found this interesting. I know me from the past would love to watch a video like this, but I do feel happy that instead I actually just read the book. Like I said, this is a big accomplishment for me. And it's really... Most people would probably assume that it would, uh, reading the book would make me dislike the Kubrick film a bit, or, or maybe a little bit more, but no, it actually kind of makes me like it even more, because like I was saying, it, it gives more backstory, it gives more context for things that were a little more vague. So, I'm gonna rewatch it. I haven't rewatched the movie yet, but I'm, I'm definitely going to. So, anyway, if there are things that you think I missed in this, or things you just want to talk about, the movie, the book, whatever... Go ahead and put the comments down there. I mean, this wasn't this wasn't so much for me to talk about the movie, but this was just kind of for me to talk about what extra is in the book that's not in the movie. That's basically it. So, but put some comments down there if you want to talk about this. We can get nerdy because that's what I'm I'm all about on this channel: getting horror nerdy. Uh, do me a quick favor though, hit that subscribe button. I really do appreciate it when people subscribe. Literally, I get an email every time I get a new subscriber. I look at who it is. And I think to myself, thank you to this person. That is that is quite awesome. And that's your way to repay me. If you've liked any video I've ever done, just hit that subscribe button real quick and painless, and I appreciate that. Also hit the notification bell, though, because then you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos like this or movie reviews or unboxings or any of that jazz. But regardless, I appreciate you taking the time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.